Thank you, uh, Dr. Rola and Dr. Peter Davis. A very nice session. There's a lot of questions. I, uh, I don't know if we can cover all, but uh, I, actually, uh, these uh, many of those questions directed towards both of you. So, whoever chip in and answer. <laughs> So anyway, uh, we start with the first question. Uh, they want to ask about uh, the FiO2 requirement at the chest compression. Uh, they want to know if during the chest compression, if they, uh, uh, if they use less than 100% oxygen, is there any uh, bad outcome? Is there any study about that? And what is your expert opinion about that? to use less than 100% ox oxygen during chest compression? Yeah, maybe I could answer that question. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, well, as you know, the, the guideline, ILPR guidelines, um, at least the 2015 guidelines, still recommend to use 100% oxygen during chest compressions. I don't know, maybe Peter Davis knows the 2020 guidelines, uh, but I haven't seen them yet. Um, the reason um, ILCOR still recommend 100% oxygen for chest compressions is that we don't have any clinical studies. But recently, we and others, so we, we have carried out uh, studies in newborn piglets with chest compression in newborn piglets. And we've been able to show that outcome is as good with air, starting with air uh, as with 100% oxygen. We even published a meta-analysis with these animal studies showing that with Schmelcher and co-workers, his group. Uh, still, we, we need um, clinical studies. Uh, and I, I guess ILCO will not change the guidelines before we have clinical data. Maybe Peter could uh, comment on that. It's a very interesting question, isn't it? It's it's quite it's based on emotion and not on science. I, I was there when we were discussing at, at Ilcor this this uh, what should we use, and um, we we have to admit that we do not know. Uh, we're worried about oxygen toxicity, but we're we're at a point where we're throwing everything at the baby. We're putting we're giving the baby chest compressions. We're we're intubating and ventilating the baby. Therefore, we should give the maximum amount of oxygen uh, that we can. Now, that's not good scientific logic, and uh, we must admit that. I, I suspect that we, we will be able to reconsider um, that recommendation as, as more animal work comes. It's going to be very difficult to do a randomised trial enrolling only babies that are having uh, chest compressions. I think that's, that's very difficult, but very difficult to move um, clinicians who are used to using 100% in that in that situation. So it's it's a difficult question. There is no um, no evidence based answer at, at this stage. I, I think you could you could argue either way, but for the moment, Ilkor is saying 100%, but not very confidently. So I guess this means, Peter, that uh, Ilkor is not changing in the new guidelines. Uh, it's not on the agenda, um, Ola. Yeah. yeah, we have another. The good thing about ILCOR now is that we're able to review things a little bit more swiftly. So if, if evidence becomes available in the next uh, couple of years, it can come into recommendations fairly quickly, but uh, yeah. there's no sign of that. So I, I, we, we, we tried to launch a, a clinical study on this, um, but it's very difficult. I mean, we, we need a lot of babies. We, we probably need to be a multi-center study, but it, it's highly needed. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, th thank you. Uh, the second question is that uh, related to, uh, somehow related to that, that pulse oximeter that, uh, takes some time to pick up. Uh, so how do, uh, we can guide ourselves for target FIO2? Uh, and it has happened just yesterday in our unit that uh, one of the pulse oximeter and delivery suites taking at least one and a half to two minutes yeah. to pick it up. Pick it up. So both of you can comment on that. Yeah. You first, Carla. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we know that, and then that's uh, one of the drawbacks with the pulse oximeter, that it takes ninety seconds, sometimes up to two minutes, before we get a, a good signal. Um, so, so, um, but for the 
saturation, we don't have anything better, I think. Uh, okay. But for the heart rate, uh, um, as I showed, I mean, ECG is, is probably, it's faster. We know it's faster, uh, but also ECG has its uh, drawbacks. Yeah. So, Dr. Peter, uh, I will add for you, uh, is there any consideration of using a near infrared spectroscopy in the delivery room? Uh, we are not, we are not doing that, uh, Janae, but, uh, and I, I think oh, my, my personal belief is that we probably need less technology rather than more in that first couple of minutes, mm -hmm. right? If we're so focused on the number, we're forgetting to look at the baby, we're forgetting what the baby needs, and that's good ventilation, good mask position yeah. and attention to detail with that for the first minute or two. So I'd much prefer people were focused on that than a number uh, coming or not coming um, on a saturation monitor. And I think Ola might have alluded to this. One of the risks of, of getting an ECG reading very early on is um, we're not quite sure what to do with it. And, and people can leap a couple of steps ahead and start doing, for instance, cardiac massage when all the baby might need is a little bit of stimulation or perhaps some, some good quality ventilation. I don't know what you think about that, Ola. I think that's a very important comment and I, I completely agree with you. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, next is the about steroids. So Dr. Davis, uh, what is your criteria for a steroid for late preterm deliveries? So for example, like 36 weeker who requires some oxygenation um, for a prolonged period of time. So what do you think about that? We're not big fans of, uh, of using steroids at all. We, we really make the baby earn their steroids. So we would use them for um, hardly ever beyond the extremely preterm range. We use it for babies who are, are stuck on the ventilator uh, and who are, have got you know, uh, quite reasonable oxygen requirements. Um, so that's, that's, that's our particular approach. We, we would very rarely use steroids okay. in, in the more mature baby. And uh, uh, related to the same question, that do you have a practice of administering uh, steroids for extubation, like a pre-extubation? steroid or DART therapy? Yeah. Um, for extubation, uh, not, not typically for the first extubation, we would, we would not be using steroids routinely. If, for, if a baby has had a, a previous extubation and they've failed because of stridor or an evidence of cord swelling, then the next time we would, uh, we would give the baby steroids prior to extubation. Okay. For some babies who are stuck on the ventilator, yes, we would give steroids in an effort to wean and, and extubate them. So yes, that's a different, a different question. And uh, the other question, question is, uh, can we repeat the DART course? One course is enough or two course? Any yeah, recommendation I, I, of that? I rushed through that slide, but part of the, uh, the DART protocol was at, if at the end of the 10 days of therapy, the clinician wanted to give another 10 days, that was fine. So um, I think about a quarter of the babies in the in the DART trial got a second round of 10 days of steroids. So we, we would uh, use that in practice as well now that if, if the baby is rebounding at the end of the 10 days, uh, going back into more, more oxygen or threatening to go back onto the ventilator, we would restart the steroids and, and, and wean them down again. Uh, you mentioned about uh, butyrosinide uh, nebulization. So is there any uh, recommendation in the post uh, extubation, after extubation of those babies? I'm not aware of any, any studies of, of, of that. Uh, um, so we, we, we don't use it and I wouldn't be recommending it. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rola, the, uh, the question is uh, when trying to cover the golden millet, do we get adequate time for reassessing uh, the step-by-step -step initial interventions? So the thing is that the golden minute is really a minute and then step-by-step -step interventions as uh, by the NRP algorithm, uh, it is uh, feasible or it can be done? Yeah. Well, uh, the question is if it's too... Um, um, adequate? Or too uh, ambitious, yeah. this golden minute. And, I think there are studies, uh, for instance, from um, um, 
O'Donnell's group in, in Dublin uh, showing that it, it's very difficult to achieve this, uh, what we want during the golden minute. And, and also this uh, very, I showed you the data from four studies uh, showing that it's difficult to start ventilation within uh, the first minute. So, so, so maybe the golden minute is not realistic, but I think still it, it should be a kind of a target, a, a goal. Uh, I would like to hear Peter's uh, opinion about that, because I think th this is an important question. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Colum, Colum O'Donnell was one, of, was one of our fellows and we, uh, we love him dearly. And he, he was, he's very much an iconoclast. He likes to uh, poke at authority and uh, anything that's, that's rigid, like you must do this in, in one minute, he would be very uh, much against. And I tend to agree with him. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to instill a sense of panic um, in that first minute to have a rush um, is, is probably not the way to go. We need to be calm and methodical and, and work through things logically, not be driven by the clock, just uh, do a good job. And that will probably take more than a minute. And I think you, you made a good argument that, that this trying to get everything done in a, a minute just doesn't happen. But uh, it doesn't mean we take our eyes off the baby. It means we, it just means we, we keep our eyes on the baby and we work methodically through those steps, not paying attention to the clock necessarily. But, but maybe, you know, I think the, the, the introduction of the term the gold minute has been important because it has taught us that we should focus on certain basic aspects the first minute so maybe we should still talk about the golden minute but we should know that maybe the golden minute is not 60 seconds maybe it's uh, 80 seconds or 90 seconds it, do it doesn't sound as good does it Ola? you know the golden yeah. 85 seconds it, no, it no. Just <laughs> same yeah uh, uh, dr Ola, uh, actually uh, you mentioned this but i am repeating it uh, uh, you mentioned in your talk uh, but the question is that in very premature baby if we start from 21% and then titrate up, it is feasible or we have to start with 30%? That's the question. Well, we, we recommend now for babies less than 28 weeks to start with 30% um, oxygen. Okay. That's also the European guidelines. Um, and what I, I said uh, is that we don't know if this is the optimal. I don't think, I'm, my opinion is I don't think it should be 100% that maybe it should be 40% or 50%. For babies between 28 and 31 weeks, we say 21 to 30% oxygen. Uh, and if you ask my personal opinion, I would rather start with 30% than air, I think, for these, also these babies. But we don't have, in my opinion, we don't have data to, to really uh, say what is, what is the better. Uh, okay, we have a lot of questions because of the timing of our colleagues in the USA is waiting for the second session. Uh, they are going to be with us. Uh, but my last question to Dr. Peter Davis is my question. So when the PLUS trial uh, will come out or get some idea, what is yeah, the timeline? We're, we're about two years into a four-year recruitment uh, Junaid, yeah. so we, we, we've still got a lot of work to do, but the babies are coming in, but this is a large trial and, and large tri okay. trials take time to complete. But uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to share this with you in, in maybe uh, three years time. Okay. okay, so thank you once again, uh, both of you, a very nice uh, session and I hope all the participants uh, enjoyed it. Thank you, Dr. Ola. Thank you, Dr. Peter Davis. And uh, inshallah, we'll see you, meet you uh, personally, not virtually. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Inshallah, Junaid.